Hey guys, it's Jordan here from Switchwatch. How are you all doing today? Now today's review is of Freedom Planet on the Nintendo Switch. Now this is a game that's been around a while, but it's finally heading to the Nintendo Switch and I'm excited to see how it is. Now if you're new here, don't forget to click that subscribe button for all the latest Nintendo Switch reviews, gameplays and features. It's well worth it, I promise you. Anyways, let's get on with it. Think back to a time before Sonic Mania. It wasn't that long ago and yet many of you will have already forgotten the pain of being a Sonic fan prior to the Christian Whitehead led mascot renaissance. While 3D Sonic titles of varying quality from the decent to mediocre to terrible came and went, the lack of a true Sonic classic hurt the fans hard. And indeed it was the fans who stepped up to fill the void. There had been a handful of Sonic inspired titles before the release of Sonic Mania, but the one that seemed to gain the most traction and buzz was Freedom Planet. Originally an attempt at a fan game, this release by Galaxy Trail morphed into its own game and given its own identity. Despite looks, characters and the plot being very different, Freedom Planet was the Sonic game fans were looking for. The plot of Freedom Planet revolves around the Kingdom Stone, a stone so powerful that it provides almost endless energy to the citizens of the world. Naturally there's a bit of a debate as to who gets their mitts on it, but that's nothing compared to the Korea world invading villain that wants to take it for his own to power his armies and conquer the known universe. Lord Brevin is his name and it's up to you and your ragtag group of friends to stop him one way or another. Of the three main characters, Lilac is the main protagonist, a courageous dragon girl who can dash here and there with her dragon powers. Alongside her is Carol the Cat, the typical side character who comes across as a little more stubborn and lazy but has always got her friends back. Finally there's Mila, an innocent dog girl who is in search of her lost parents. Together with their duck turtle friend Tork, they try to stop Lord Brevin and his dastardly plans. Now compared to what you may expect from a Sonic-like game, the story is actually quite prominent. There are lengthy cutscenes at the beginning and end of each stage that help flesh out a surprisingly commendable storyline as different kingdoms compete and ally during Lord Brevin's interference. There are the odd tonal shifts which will often make you feel weird but I surprisingly enjoyed what Freedom Planet had to tell as its story. For those concerned about the length of cutscenes and trust me they can go on a long time, Galaxy Trail has been consumer friendly enough to include a classic mode right from the off in case you want to play the stages and ignore the story altogether. The gameplay is very similar to Sonic games but it has its own personality too. You can feel Sonic was the main inspiration but there are others in there too with the combat and especially the boss battles being what I feel ascend above what Sonic had to offer. Levels are obviously quite huge with multiple pathways as you head from left to right, blitzing through enemies, obstacles and small puzzle elements. They really are bigger than what you may be used to as levels can go on for like 20 minutes or so. With all the secret areas and different paths to take, there's no way you can see everything on your first playthrough. Just like a good Sonic game, you'll want to go through the game multiple times to find the quickest route to speed up your times. It's not all about speed though, there's a fairly big focus on combating enemies. Not all of them but there are many points where you'll want to take it slow and fight enemies that are in your way. Each of the characters have their own unique moves, Lilac can do a double jump which includes a tailspin of sorts damaging enemies, she has a normal attack as well and some other moves like a uppercut and a ground stomp should the situation permit. Her biggest asset is her dash attack which can zip her straight ahead or in diagonals. This is a cool ability and is also very powerful in dealing heavy damage multiple times to multiple enemies. You can't use it all the time though as there is a cooldown meter which is also shared with a double jump attack. Carol's campaign follows pretty much the same route as Lilac's but she's much slower and methodical. Her double jump is more of a pounce than something to give her height. But on the other hand, she can jump walls. She can't dash like Lilac but at set points within each level you come across gas cans which means she can use her trademark motorbike to plow through environments for a short time. While her campaign is the same, the fact that she plays very differently makes it almost feel completely different. Finally there's Mila who is even further removed from the standard gameplay. Not only does she play differently but she has her own stages too. She's more fragile than her allies and is more of a defensive fighter as she can form blocks to throw as well as using a shield like attack. So that's three very different characters that really change the way the game plays. I know that the developers had a plan to release even more characters but instead decided to concentrate on the sequel. Either way, I think it's a nice solid variety with enough there. While the platforming, level design and mechanics are really fun and intuitive, for me it's the boss battles that really separate Freedom Planet from those around it. Each stage has a mid boss battle as well as an epic end of level boss too. They can be brutal to the unprepared as they don't let up for one second. 
Bosses are huge and often spread over large parts of the stage. On your first playthrough, I'm sure you'll get stuck against a good few of them and you will need to try multiple times in order to conquer them. This is my second time playing the game and I still had trouble with some of them. Complaints of Freedom Planet are few and far between, mostly too minor to even mention. There is one big complaint though that does hamper my enjoyment a fair bit. Not enough to write off the game or anything, but just enough to peg it down to a level below its true potential. It's the last couple of stages that really let things go off the rails in terms of enemies. I'm all for challenge, but Freedom Planet goes overboard in just at how many enemies it throws at you at once during the climax of the game. I see that they did this to show the power of Lord Brevin, but honestly, it takes a lot of fun out of the game for me, as you just do your best to pass them all, using invincibility frames just to cheese them. Had the latter stages been more poised and balanced like the other 80% of the game, I feel Freedom Planet could have achieved near perfection execution in what it set out to do. Like I said, it doesn't ruin the game in any way, but it just stops it reaching its full potential. I honestly like Freedom Planet more than any other Sonic game. Sure, you can tell it lacks the budget of its inspiration, and yet I find it endlessly more replayable thanks to its character, humour, and the more combat-based approach to dealing with enemies. I like Sonic Mania, but I think I like Freedom Planet just a little bit more. Yes, it does like that polish in certain aspects of level design compared to the former, but I know I would choose to play Freedom Planet any day. It's visually a very lovely game, especially in the level artwork. There's a really nice mix of different themes from each level, whether it's the classic grassland opening to the astounding looking Chinese city inspired level midway through the game. Each one has its own personality and their uniqueness means that you'll never get them mixed up or confused with each other. It is retro pixel art, which from what you guys have been commenting recently, I feel there's an air of fatigue when it comes to indie games going for the retro pixel art. In the top right hand corner, I'd love to know how you guys feel about pixel art in games these days. Are you tired of them or can you still not get enough of the retro goodness? Let us know. If I was to be overly harsh in regards to the visuals, it has to be in the direction of the character art. They are okay, but look as though they've been ripped straight from someone's hobbyist deviant art page. While the pixel work is great, their design just doesn't scream professional to me. Performance wise, the game is pretty much perfect as far as I can tell, so you don't need to worry about that. The soundtrack for me is very good too. There's plenty of Asian style themes going on in it, just like in the visuals, but it's not always there and it mixes it up nicely with some high energy tunes that you'd be happy to hear in any Sonic game. I really like it and although some of the tracks tend to blend together a little during gameplay, some of them really stand out like the Dragon Valley pieces and the wonderful Fortune Night music. They'll be playing in your head for a very long time. This is also the kind of game soundtrack that you'd be happy to listen to at any time, even when you're not playing the game. Indeed, I have the songs to this game on my phone that I listen to regularly. As for value, while well, Freedom Planet is priced at $14.99 in the US and £12.99 in the UK, I think that's great value for money, personally. It's a great game with lots of love gone into it, and with three largely different campaigns in regards to playstyles, that's about 10 hours worth right there. Plus, finding all of the hidden tokens for you completionists out there to unlock the soundtrack and concept art will add another good few hours on top of that too. It works out cheaper than Sonic Mania by $5, and I think it offers just about the same amount of content too, so I think Freedom Planet is good value for your hard earned cash. Overall for me, Freedom Planet is a great game with lots of things going for it. It tries to emulate the classic Sonic feeling while going in its own way, and in all honesty, I like it more. Sure, that may be my own personal bias of not liking Sonic all that much to begin with, despite me acknowledging its merits for others. We live in a time where Sonic Mania exists, but the Blue Blur's recent release hasn't done anything to diminish the appreciation that I have for Freedom Planet. It plays really well, I love the speed and the combat in equal measure, as well as the visual and audio presentation. There is the big issue of the later stages just going way overboard with enemies, not in the way of difficulty, but just incredibly disruptive and cheap, which does sour the experience a little. But anyways, we know that Freedom Planet 2 is well into development, and if it's as good as this, then we may just have one of the best indie game series out there. For me, Freedom Planet is an 8.5 out of 10. Okay guys, thank you very much for watching this. If you're a regular Switch watcher, then hit that like button and tell us what you answered in the poll above. Do you have indie pixel art fatigue? Let us know. If you're new here and found this review useful in any way, then be sure to hit that subscribe button and that little bell button for all the latest Nintendo Switch reviews. Finally, head over to the website switchwatch.co.uk. That's well worth a daily look. I've been Jonah from Switchwatch, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.